In that box is a large 3D printer. This is what it's gonna look like when it's fully assembled, but we're not there yet. So the shipping weight on that thing is 55 pounds. To put that into perspective, my six month old baby only weighs 15 pounds. So it's almost four of him. It's basically the weight of an average third grader. It's not small. This is the house plant that my mom gave me and it looks sad sitting here in the corner on the floor. So here's the plan. We're gonna assemble that machine and then we're gonna 3D print a plant stand. Before I do that, I have to give the usual disclaimers. If you wanna read those, pause the video in three, two, one. Now that that's out of the way, let's do this. Let me take this opportunity to talk about some of the componentry that I'm seeing in this kit because this is next level stuff. Everything is laser cut or CNC machined aluminum. Uh, it's, it's all metal construction. Take a look at this hot end. That is a genuine BL touch. That's not a knockoff, just phenomenal. Two of these low profile, small uh, blower motors, which give you cooling from both sides of the nozzle, just amazing. Way better than anything on the market. That's the best that I've seen stock. Um, also CNC, just look at this, incredible. Here's the extruder, it's geared. The rods here are all uh, carbon fiber and the, the ends, unlike that, uh, the, the wiggle and the slop that I had with the, um, with the Anycubic Castle, these, uh, these have no play. I can't feel any play in them. Um, brand name, 16 gigabyte SD card. Let's take a look at the control board uh, before we assemble this thing. This is an MKS S-Base version 1.3. Uh, you know, it, it is a bit of a copycat product, but all the reviews say that this is a great alternative to a smoothie board. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit old. 2013, 14, and 15 was really the, the height of smoothie boards as far as being the pinnacle of 3D printing technology. But um, now for 32-bit processors, we've really moved on to uh, like the Duet board is I think the most popular uh, as far as the, the high, high computing power goes. Now, any of these 32-bit boards are just gonna be in a whole different category, just a new class compared to the glorified Arduino boards. We're talking your Roomba board, your Rambo board, the Ramps 1.4, any of those boards running uh, Arduino-based software and hardware. As we know, uh, running a Delta printer requires more processor power. Uh, computing those arcs and tangents and all that uh, in the movement takes a lot of work uh, for that board. So this is much more up to the task than the Arduino based uh, systems. All right, let's give that time lapse another try. Okay, I'm in the middle of assembling the printer here and I just wanted to show you guys uh, the underside of the bed because we're not gonna get another chance to look at it. This is a 110 volt, 300 watt silicone bed heater. Highest quality that I've ever seen. Uh, this is leaps and bounds beyond uh, the printed circuit board based uh, bed heaters that you see on almost every other printer these days. Now this was a style uh, that was really popular a few years ago. Um, but it's just a little bit more expensive to make. And so for cost cutting reasons, none of the other printers come with it. It's the better option, but you know, it's more expensive, so we don't see it. Anyway, let's finish putting this thing together.
thing is so big. Ah, oh, look at it. Okay, uh, well it's fully assembled and plugged in, powered up. Back here, uh, there's a readout on the power supply which says 24 volts, so that's awesome. Pretty much necessary to get this bed heater um, heated up in a reasonable amount of time, or maybe even at all. Those silicone bed heaters really do suck a lot of power. Um, this is the interface, little nice little touch screen that you can pull off the printer so it's easier to get at because, again, the printer is so large. The problem that I'm having now is that none of the buttons do anything. So I can certainly navigate into menus, but as soon as I tell the printer to move or do anything like that, nothing happens. Um, now, one of two things is going on. Either I've got the thing miswired somehow, and I've got to go, go through my wiring and sort of track that down, but I don't think that's the case because the board came all pre-connected. All the wires were already where they're supposed to be. So it was a very easy wiring job, and I didn't even have to consult the manual for the wiring. Um, so what I think is happening is that the operating system needs to be updated. The smoothieware basically needs to be updated. And that is what came on the SD card. This 16 gigabyte SAN disk was already opened in the package. And so there's an update to the, the whole operating system right here. So I'm gonna install that uh, and then do a little calibration uh, on the printer. And after that, we'll be printing. The printer came with that full-size SanDisk SD card, but it also uh, had a micro SD card uh, already installed in the slot on the MKS S-Base control board. Um, looking here on the computer, we see that the USB drive H here is that micro SD card, and it just has this configuration firmware deal going on. So it's already been installed with some version of SmoothieWare. Um, but here on the SanDisk, uh, the full-size card, we see um, all of these files. So here's the update instructions, and that is what we're looking at here on the left. So I'm just going to follow these instructions, but I'm going to make one small change before I do that. Here on the GitHub page, I'm going to download the latest version of firmware.bin. So this is going on the SD card. I'm going to delete the firmware.bin that came from TiVo, Tevo, and replace it with... Uh, this new version. So that should be the most up-to-date uh, smoothieware and the config should work just fine with the, the latest update. Okay, this is a good moment to try to untangle the open source issue as it relates to this printer. Um, the only reason that I'm able to update smoothieware onto the TiVo Little Monster is because smoothieware is an open source project. You know, all the files are available here on GitHub. Smoothie board also is open source. Here on the SmoothieWare website, we can see the reference designs for the board are available right at that link. So it's all published. Anybody can modify it and have a dandy time. Over here on Thingiverse, we find the Tevo Little Monster Design Draft Open Source Project. Tevo, Tevo, I don't really know how to pronounce that. But anyway, here's the printer. And this is the, uh, an open source project. You know, They're trying to make it Creative Commons attribution licensed. They're trying to go open source of this printer. They're not doing a great job. For instance, this file here, this .stl, I downloaded that and it's nothing. It's like an empty shell of a file. It's just STL with no extension. I don't know if it's a zip. I don't know what it is. But they do have these other uh, great files. For instance, here's the complete CAD drawing uh, of the entire printer. This is uh, pretty nice. If I want to do any, like add any parts, maybe add some 3D printed parts, uh, I can just use this as a reference to, so that my parts will fit uh, nicely onto the physical structure of the printer. Also available on this page is the Little Monster Smoothie Firmware uh, file. So that's basically just the configuration file that's gonna help you there. Um, because as we just saw, you'll wanna go to SmoothieWare itself to get the latest uh, update. Now, what we're not seeing is the firmware for that other little computer. Now, there's a whole computer controlling that uh, control board. And uh, here on the, the, the Teva Little Monster site, we, we don't find whatever specifics they have, you know, for their little logo, and they change the icons up a bit. So that's something that's not posted, and I don't know why they wouldn't post it. However, I did a little bit of digging, and... Here on GitHub, I found the repository for that whole control unit. Now that is the MKS TFT 2.8. And look at that was updated 10 days ago. 
So looking at the documentation here for the, uh, the, the MKS TFT 2.8, uh, we see a complete user manual in English. I mean, I don't know how great the English is. I haven't really read this yet, but uh, it looks like almost all the information that I could need is right here. I can pretty much do everything with this printer based on what I'm seeing. Uh, how great is that? So yeah, open source for the win. Look, I could change the themes. I might even be able to add buttons. Up here, I think it's showing me how to add a runout sensor. So if my filament runs out, cool stuff. This printer looks pretty good to me uh, as far as being open source, you guys. Uh, the, the worst thing I can say about it is the schematics for the board are not published. Yeah, so maybe all of this criticism from the West is actually uh, changing uh, the way that China operates. I mean, I'm not holding my breath, but it looks like they're doing some good things here. I need to assuage myself of the guilt that I'm feeling because this printer has a knockoff board. Um, you know, that board wouldn't exist without the hard work of these people here at Smoothieware. So luckily there's this great little button right here and this is the don't feel guilty anymore button. So I'm gonna click that and let's donate 20 bucks. Donate now. Cool. And if you have an MKS S-based control board in your 3D printer, you might consider donating as well. We really need to uh, reward the original creators on these projects. Otherwise, we'll stop seeing them. And I want to see constant improvement in 3D printing. I think that's a good thing. So the full size SD card goes into the screen and the micro SD card goes into the main board. And then we come back here and turn the thing off and then back on again. Awesome. Let's try and move it. Nothing. Back. Let's try and home it. Nothing. Huh. RTFM, boys. RTFM. Right here, in pictographs. So simple, even a caveman could follow them. <laughs> Tells me how to get this thing to auto-calibrate. I didn't need to do all this uh, reinstalling of the firmware. I could have just done the auto calibration. So let's make that happen now. According to the instructions, we are supposed to go to setup. Uh, choose this to 11520. I don't know why that's important before you do the auto setup. But the next thing we do is we hit that calibrate button one time. Because I guess if you press it twice, it's going to run the auto calibrate two times in a row. And here we go. Now what that's gonna do is heat up the bed, and once the bed is up to temperature, it's gonna start doing all of the uh, auto calibration. Yep, that's getting quite warm. Here in Kira, we can see this geometry that I've made, uh, this little test print, kind of the standard thing that I've been doing. And uh, let's get this set up. So we can see that I have my TiVo Little Monster um, printer already made. But let me just go over those configurations uh, with you guys. Machine settings. So if you're gonna set this printer up, uh, just go with these settings. Now the only thing I want to talk about here is the start code. Looking at the manual, we see this section where it gives you the startup G code. And this G30 command here, uh, you increase the value to lower the nozzle, you decrease the value to lift the nozzle away from the bed. I was kind of intrigued by that uh, little bit of G code. I hadn't seen that before. So I went and looked it up and uh, I found this little section here. If you use the G code in the way that they're saying, uh, it basically changes the bed plane.
Okay, this is outstanding. It takes less than two minutes to heat up this bed from 22 degrees to 60 degrees Celsius. So it took me six tries to get that print to stick to the bed. And what I was doing is each time I tried and it failed, I would come over here in my start code uh, and adjust this value on the G30. And then I would just reslice the model, put the SD card back in the printer and try again. And this was uh, the result. So I have done no calibration to this printer. The belts are kind of loose on the machine. And uh, I think that my extruder might not be uh, extruding enough material. I don't know if you guys can see that on camera, but there's kind of a crosshatch pattern that you can see on the roof there. Um, so either my filament is too narrow, it's not a true 1.75 millimeter filament, or uh, I am not extruding enough. So, well, I have checked the, uh, the filament is indeed 1.75 millimeters. It's dead on the money. Uh, so it must be in the extruder. So we'll have to fix that. So the last thing I want to point out about this print is look at that spire, you guys. That's what good 360 degree cooling will do uh, for you. So uh, that's just much better quality than all these one-sided uh, part cooling fans that we've seen. And it's much better than no part cooling fan. I should also note that I printed this at a pretty fast speed, um, 120 millimeters per second. So um, some things got a little bit weird. Like for instance, this, See how it's kind of shrunken in here in that cube right there uh, beneath the spire? I've never seen that before and I don't really know what's causing it. Maybe the loose belts. But anyway, let's see what we can do to calibrate the machine. So one grievance that I do have with this printer is it's hard to hold the motor and press the lever so that you can slide the filament. Um, it's just kind of a pain in the butt. Okay, so here I have my flush cutters and I'm gonna cut them flush with the end of that little, uh, the, the holder for the Bowden tube. Now on the controller, we go to extrude, and we change this from five millimeters to 10 millimeters, and we press that five times. One, one, two, three, four, four, five. And it's just pumping out that blue filament there. So now put our calipers on it. And that comes out to be almost exactly 49 millimeters. Okay, I'm gonna use this stick here to figure out the correct uh, steps per millimeter. So we went 49 millimeters, but we actually wanna go 50 millimeters. And I just took a look at the configuration file and it's currently set so that 800 steps per millimeter is what's going on. So we need to get this correct value. So it's just 50 times 800 divided by 49. So we want to be at 816 steps per millimeter. This here is the SD card straight out of the MKS S-Base uh, control board. So we will just drag that here into Notepad and then we will control F steps per millimeter. Extruder hot end steps per millimeter set to 800. We want that to be 816. Then file, save, and now we'll put that back into the printer. Okay, let's see if that fixed it. Trim it off flush. Zero out my caliper. That's still at 49. So I think I might need to refresh uh, somehow. Zero. Yep, that's done it. Now, unfortunately, what I had to do was pop the micro SD card out, erase all of the files on it, put the updated configuration file along with that boot file and basically reinstall. So that means that I have to rerun the calibration routine before I can print again. So this was the first test print and I've tightened the belts. I adjusted the extruder. I also changed the print speed so that it's uh, just normal, uh, slow 3D printer print speed, 60 millimeters per second. And yeah, I think that's about it. So this is where we started, and this is where we ended up. Obviously there's no ringing. I've, I haven't seen 
uh, ringing artifacts on either of my Delta printers. Um, and that spire uh, could actually be made uh, more perfect if I did a minimal layer height, which is an option in Kira. But since I never used the minimal layer height for any of the other uh, test prints, I thought it would be unfair to do that uh, for this print. Now we can see the, the roof up in there is pretty good. I mean, it's not perfect. You know, bridging is a tough thing for 3D printers to do. Um, this one's a lot worse. We can see the, the, the string. Um, and that's, I think, just because it printed so much quicker. But yeah, that's, uh, that's the quality of print you can get with minimal effort out of this here Delta printer. So I succeeded in getting a, a very nice test print, but I don't think that I'm done with calibrating the machine just yet. Now, I was following the instruction manual uh, when I put this G30 command into my start code, but it feels like kind of a hack. So I did a little research on the internet and came up with this uh, documentation by Smoothieware about how to calibrate your Delta. So this is clearly the section where uh, Tevo got the idea for the G30 command uh, to put in their owner's manual. Um, but the thing is, this feels kind of like a hack. So I want to test something. Let's see what happens when the power goes out uh, mid-print. I'm going to come right back here and unplug the machine. Uh, so this is a very large machine. What if you had a power outage and you're in the middle of a 40-hour print? Uh, that would suck, right? Except uh, we can come right here and click the recovery button and it'll start printing right where it left off. So it's 5% uh, into that print. It's just gonna get that nozzle right back up to temperature, or I'm sorry, the bed. It's gonna get the bed back up to temperature and then continue printing. So that almost worked. It definitely resumed printing, but uh, it left this mess instead of actually printing on the part. And the reason is because the nozzle was floating about a millimeter and a half in the air. So it wasn't actually laying filament down, it was just sort of spraying it in the air. A millimeter and a half pretty much corresponds with that number right there. So uh, once the printer reset, it forgot that offset and just tried to start printing at the regular Z height. We need to figure out another way to uh, do that offset, but this involves connecting to the printer with the laptop. I'm running Repetier Host on that laptop and we're connected to the printer with that USB cable. Um, before we begin, we need to configure uh, the printer. So just make sure that you are on the correct COM port so that you can connect and also your baud rate needs to be 115, 200. We set that on the printer uh, earlier in the video. So the other thing is just give it a printer shape, 175 for the radius and 500 millimeters for the printable height. So just apply, okay. Now the next thing we need to do is connect. So we are connected. Now um, I'm just gonna clear the log down here and come up here to the G-code editor right here in the top, top right. I'm going to G28, that's the home all command. By the way, my cap locks is on because I have to have all capital letters when I'm typing G-code. So the enter button brings us to the top with the G28 command. And now uh, I know that this printer uh, is higher off the bed than it should be. So it thinks zero is floating up here in space. So I can just go to G0, which is, tells it to move Z0. And I know I'm not gonna have a collision. Okay, so now if I try to use this button right here to go down, let's see if it works. Nothing, right? So I just keep hitting it and nothing happens. Um, and the reason is that we have software end stops enabled. So we need to get rid of those. So the command here is M122 space S0. Now this is different than Marlin, which is M211. Uh, so this, the G code is different for Repetier. So Smoothieware runs on Repetier uh, G code. So I should do that and then press send. Okay, so now I should be able to click this button here well, that was funny. Uh, I actually had to enter in the command uh, G zero Z negative one uh, in order to get it to go where I wanted. And then after that, uh, Repetier host let me use the little buttons here to get there. So we, we wanna get to a place where we're using the buttons. Okay, so I'm gonna sneak down with the button. Uh, I'm going currently negative one 
each time. And I'm looking under there to see, oh, we're getting pretty darn close. So now I want to be sneaking down there by, I don't know, 0 0.01. We're, we're getting pretty darn close. Yeah, let's just put this piece of paper under here and sneak down. There we go. That feels good to me. So I'm just, just starting to catch. The command we need to use now is M114. Um, but we're gonna have to turn on ACK. Now I don't want auto scroll. It's, it's basically issuing auto commands which confuses the, um, what you see here in the, in, the, in the info panel. And so I, I don't really like, see, I don't wanna see all that. So I'm gonna clear the log, come up here and send. What we're seeing here is uh, my X is at zero, my Y is at zero, my Z is at negative 3.13. Negative 3.13 is the value that we need. So now disconnect from the printer. Uh, I would unplug it here and I'm going to power it off. Then I'm gonna take out the micro SD card. Earlier in the video, uh, I had said that we wanted to change this extruder hot end Z offset value. Uh, that's not correct. Scroll to the top, control F. Lowercase g a m m a underscore m a x. Find next. Find next. We want just gamma max, and there it is. It's, got, it's currently set to 520. So we want it to be 520 plus 3.13. So this should be 523.13. So now we save this, and that's saved to the micro SD card, and we can now eject that card. So put the uh, micro SD card back into the printer and turn the printer on and also plug it in. Come back here to Repetier Host and connect to the printer. And now we want to issue a reset command and that is just R-E-S-E-T, enter. Okay, actually let's cap locks and try that again, R-E-S-E-T. I don't know if that is needed to be uh, capitalized on that one, but uh, just for safety's sake, let's do it like that. Okay, so now I should be able to go G28, and home it, and then let's go G0, Z1, enter. And we are still way above, so that did not work. Okay, let's try this again. G28, G0 space Z0. It's a little bit tight, but I can work with that. Okay. What you just saw me magically solve was in fact a massive pain in the butt. Um, this is uh, the major problem with the printer and it's actually a twofold problem. First of all, in order to update the config file, you have to do the nuclear option. You have to completely reinstall the firmware. So that means you have to wipe the SD card for the screen, as well as the SD card for the main board. You have to put the new configuration file onto the main board micro SD card. You have to then reinstall, and after that you have to rerun the auto calibration routine. According to the Smoothieware documentation, you're supposed to be able to just issue a reset command, and that should work. Alternately, you can press the reset button on the main board and also be able to reboot with the new configuration file, which would make things a whole lot easier. But neither of those techniques work uh, with the MKS s -based board with that screen. And what I think is happening is that the screen is programmed differently from Smoothieware. So it interfaces and it works, but there's some miscommunication there, which means that you need to do that nuclear BS and just completely wipe it every time you need to change that value. So this is why the instruction manual does not teach you this method. However, we'll see in a moment why you want to do it this way, okay? Um, and there it goes. And the other major problem that I'm having is this massive variation between uh, reading. So I'll run an auto calibration routine and then without changing the configuration file, uh, I'll run the auto calibration routine again and I'll get a totally different uh, Z height. So let's talk about this because if the machine was functioning correctly, then every time I ran the mesh bed leveling algorithm and subsequently uh, did a G0, Z0, I should get pretty much the exact same position on the printer. 
there's always going to be some variance. I mean, but we're talking less than a tenth of an inch of variance is acceptable. That will still print every time. Um, the problem is this big wide variance. And I just didn't know how much the variance was that I'm looking at, so I decided to run a test. Ten times in a row, I did that where I ran the mesh bed leveling algorithm and then zeroed the head. And I measured the distance and wrote it down. So my biggest distance off the bed was 0.45 millimeters. That's half a millimeter. And my smallest distance was down into the bed. It was a negative 0.54 millimeters. So that's, yeah, that's a millimeter. So I'm, I'm varying by a millimeter, which is huge. Now what could cause that, right? So um, a lot of people online are blaming the BL touch sensor, but I know that's a really good sensor, unless this is a knockoff, which I'm pretty sure it isn't. So it can't be the sensor. What else can cause it? The motors, the stepper motors could be skipping. They could be losing their place, right? Well, the engineers who designed this printer did a really good job on everything that I've looked at. I can't imagine that they messed up with the stepper motors. So if the stepper motors are adequate to the task, um, something in the setup as I've built it is not right. So there's another problem. I have to figure out where um, sort of this resistance in the system is coming from, why it's so hard for those stepper motors to move the, uh, the head around. And this is the root of that problem. You see the vertical carriage here? It takes a lot of force to get it to move and it just stays. It should fall all the way to the bottom here. There shouldn't be so much friction, right? So they've given us uh, these eccentric nuts to adjust the tension on the pulley wheels, which is a fantastic solution. I've taken apart one of these assemblies and you can see the off-center hole drilled in the concentric nut. So that basically allows you, as you spin the nut, it's farther away from that edge at this point. And now if you spin it 180 degrees, it's much closer to that edge. So we want it to be as far away from that edge as possible because we need to loosen the tension so that happens to be at that spot right there. So I've used my centering punch here to mark the place where the concentric nut has the most thickness. Now I have a little dot for reference. I hope you guys can see that little dot right there at the top. So that means that the most thickness is facing directly towards the camera, which means that those two pulleys should be as skinny or as close together as they can possibly get. So putting that back into the channel here, uh, we see, holy shit, it's fixed. Wow, I just did that a minute ago, you guys, off camera, and it totally did not work. So I guess there is enough adjustability in those uh, concentric nuts. Um, if you do it right, you can get that to slide. So that's where you need it. Uh, that'll totally solve the problem. Now what you want is uh, for it to slide freely with no wiggle. And we can see I've got a little bit of slop. So let me just adjust that nut until it slides freely. But see the problem now is I'm back to the place where the dot is now faced forward and again I'm too tight. You see it won't move. So to help this along uh, you can force it into position with a pair of pliers. And that is perfect. There is no slop, no wiggle, and yet it will fall freely. So that's where we want it. So this is going to work. But it didn't work. Well. It kind of worked. Basically, after I put the printer back together, I ran another series of tests. Without changing the config file, I would just run a mesh bed leveling algorithm, then zero the head, take a measurement, same as before, uh, and this time I got a variance of 0.5 millimeters, which is much better. That's a 50% improvement, which is huge, but still not workable. We're not in the territory that we need it to be in. We need to be repeatable within uh, 0.1 millimeters or under 0.1 millimeters of repeatability, um, preferably like 0 0.01 millimeters of repeatability. But I got lucky because I ran this nine times and on the ninth trial, my value was 0 0.06 millimeters. So that's within a tenth of a millimeter of the bed height, which means that I can start printing without using the G30 command in my start code. Why would I do all of this hard work instead of just using the G30 command like it says in the owner manual? Here's why. What if you have a power outage in the middle of your print? You can just click on recovery. 
Once it gets up to temperature, it does a home all. And then it starts printing right where it left off. How cool is that? Fourteen and a half hours later and we have a mostly successful print. So let's just pop this off now. One leg at a time here. That bed is getting cool reasonably quickly. Um, pretty easy. And there we go. So here it is. Um, as far as the design goes, it tapers uh, in the diameter of the circle from the bottom. It gets smaller to the top, so it's got a taper there. But also the individual uh, members go from a large diameter to a smaller diameter. So I had a lot of fun making this. Um, now it does have some uh, salmon skinning, so the typical Delta uh, artifact that you would expect to see. And also, you know, um, maybe there's like a retraction issue. I've got some sort of schmutz that I'd like to sort of chip off or maybe make it so it doesn't print that. Um, overall, pretty good print. That is until I got to about three quarters of the way up. And at that point in time, I had a small layer shift. And then I had another much larger layer shift near the top. And uh, that one, when it was printing the very top up here, um, it actually caught on the print head and it broke it off because it wasn't strong enough to withstand those forces. Um, the problem I think is that I was touching it. So I was actually squeezing the, uh, the, the walls to see how much flex there was, to see how strong it would be while it was in the middle of printing. So very foolish of me to do that, but I, I think that's where the layer shifting issue came from in this case. Yeah, so I've got this roll of wood fill PLA. And this is kind of jarring as far as a plant stand goes. It's just very, very red. Um, so I'm thinking that the natural color of the wood fill will be a lot better uh, as far as the decor in the living room goes. So I'm gonna see if I can reprint this, and this time I won't touch it, so I hope that those um, layer shifts are not gonna happen. And we're gonna see uh, if we get a successful print this time. So stick around at the very end of this video after the outro, uh, I'll show the finished product with the wood fill. And let's give this printer a numerical score. You can pause the video if you wanna see the points given to each of the items, but let's just talk about the totals. The point total for this printer was 82, with a $789 price point, gives this a value of 10.4. And comparing to the Troncy X5S, which is the highest scoring printer I've reviewed up until now, uh, that printer earned a 57 points, but got a value of 16.3. So uh, less than half of the price uh, gives you a much better value proposition. So that's what happens as these things drop in price, the value goes up just because they will hit a lot of these uh, basic points. So you want maximum points, you spend the money. You want good value, you spend less money. And just for comparison, I've given the Prusa i3 Mark III a trial in absentia, and it earned a 78 points. Uh, which gave it a similar value proposition, actually the same value proposition of 10.4 because, because the Prusa, despite scoring four points less, is also uh, almost $40 cheaper. So as you just saw, the Tivo Little Monster can make some phenomenal prints, but it's not perfect. So what can I say bad about that printer? Well, first of all, it's kind of expensive. Uh, it's well under $1,000, uh, so it's still in the budget 3D printer category, uh, and in this case, you pay for what you get. Getting the 32-bit board and all the other things that we covered, uh, I think is really worth the price. But it's probably out of a lot of your price ranges. People who are looking to spend at most like $300 on a printer uh, should probably steer clear of the $750 printer. The sensitivity on the touchscreen is terrible. Sometimes I gotta hit that button two or three times before it activates. This is a small issue, but there's no thermal insulation on the hot end, on the heater block. So I might make a uh, silicone boot for it or just do the classic Kapton and insulation wrap. Uh, but either way, it needs some of that. And finally, uh, this putty knife that it came with is kind of a piece of crap. It's uh, flexible enough, but the edge on it is rough, like a saw blade almost. So I'd have to fix that. And these things I'm definitely going to upgrade, but we're gonna hopefully make another video 
featuring all the upgrades to this printer, including uh, Trinamic stepper sticks. I'm gonna go on Thingiverse and download a couple of solutions to common problems that other uh, TiVo Little Monster users have faced. And when I'm all done with that, I should have a, a pretty nice printer. In fact, it'll be so nice that uh, I probably won't use any of my other printers after I do that. Um, at this point in time, uh, emotionally speaking, I'm uninterested in all of the other printers. But I know that you guys uh, are not in the market for uh, you know closer to thousand dollar printers. So I will finish up this um, push that I've been doing to really cover all the 3D printers that I can get my hands on and review them so that you guys can make informed decisions. But so far, this printer is uh, my favorite by orders of magnitude and I can't imagine another printer that I would like as much as this one. Even if I got a uh, Western made uh, printer with, with all the bells and whistles on it, it's still gonna do the same job. It's gonna have a smaller print volume and maybe it's more reliable, but this one's a Delta and that's just a whole lot of fun to, to watch it work. So um, I think this is gonna be my go-to printer from now on. If you wanna purchase it, there will be a link in the description down below. As I posted at the beginning of this video, I don't make any money from that link. So shop around if you can find a lower price more power to you. But one thing to note, uh, if these videos of mine uh, become successful and Gearbest starts making a lot of sales from them, uh, Gearbest ups their prices. And this uh, printer is at the lowest price that I've ever seen it currently, so get on it soon if you are gonna buy that printer. And if you do get it, I have a couple of quick pointers for you. First of all, this is the easiest kit that I have assembled yet. Uh, it really does make the most sense. It's just very intuitive as it goes together. But the instructions are a little vague and out of order as far as that top plate is concerned. First of all, the stepper wiring, X, Y, and Z go in these corners relative to the front of the machine. This will ensure that your bed is set up correctly so that when you're looking at the front of the machine, the front edge of the machine is the X axis and going away from you is the Y axis. Now before you attach the top plate to the vertical uprights with those 12 screws, make sure that you first put the limit switches on the underside and then attach the stepper motors with the cable plugs aimed in this direction. After that, double check your vertical carriages. One of mine had a full twist in the belt and so I had to redo that and you don't wanna to have to take that plate on and off. So after you've done all those things, attach the plate and you won't have any issues. Uh, you've watched a lot of YouTube videos and you know what I want you to do now, so please do it. And let's pop this print off the bed. Uh, just like last time, it's releasing pretty easily from that uh, textured glass. This print is now finished and it is significantly worse than the red one. So loosening the tension on the pulley wheels seems to have had a, a negative effect on things. Clearly, I am still uh, missing a lot of steps in the stepper motors. And this is most evident when you look at this. So I'm holding it flat. Let me just drop that straight down and we can see how much taller this side is than that side. I mean, we're talking probably an inch difference. And that's because one of the stepper motors is losing more steps than the other one. And as it prints higher and higher, it just starts to lean. Clearly, there's a lot of work that I have to do to that printer until I can get it printing optimally. There it is. Well, tune in next time and see if I can get this printer performing up to its true potential.